Okay guys, in this video we are going to be talking in more detail about the quantum numbers for electrons within the hydrogen atom. And specifically I wanted to show you some graphics that will hopefully make these atomic orbitals make a little bit more sense. Uh, recall from the last video that atomic orbitals are a wave function for an electron within an atom. Uh, and they are described by four quantum numbers. The principal quantum number, the angular momentum quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, and the spin quantum number. And so we're going to talk about those in more detail. Uh, and we're going to start with the principal quantum number. So the atomic orbital has an energy. So an electron that has a wave function described by one of these atomic orbitals uh, has a particular energy, and that energy increases with the principal quantum number. Uh, and that's very similar to what uh, the case was when we looked at the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom. So both the Bohr model and quantum mechanics predict the same energy dependence for the energy of an electron in a hydrogen atom. The energy depends on the principal quantum number only, uh, and it has this dependence. It's minus 1 over the uh, principal quantum number squared. Uh, in quantum mechanics, the principal quantum number also um, relates to the size of the atomic orbital. That is the spatial extent of the atomic orbital. Uh, so I want to have you recall that uh, when you have a wave function, uh, it, represents the, uh, it represents the electron in this case. And the wave that represents the electron is a non-local object. That is, it's spread out in space. There's no one point in space that you can attribute to the electron because it's fundamentally a wave-like object. However, you can ask the question, what's the probability that I will find the electron at a particular distance from the nucleus, for example? Quantum mechanics is able to address that question and you use the wave function to answer that question. And so built into the wave function is information related to what's the probability of finding the electron at a certain distance from the nucleus. And what you find as the principal quantum number of the atomic orbital increases is that the most probable radius of the electron also increases. And that's what's depicted in these figures over here. Uh, so for s orbitals, it turns out that they are spherically symmetric about the nucleus, and so that's what these spheres represent. They represent different s orbitals. This small one here is a 1s orbital, and you can think of the size of the orbital itself as being in some way proportional to uh, how far away the nucleus, how far away from the nucleus the electron can be found. And so the bigger the sphere, uh, essentially, the, the higher the probability of finding the electron uh, away from the center of the nucleus. So for a 1s orbital, they're rather compact. And if you look at this profile here, which imagines that you, um, you start at the center of the nucleus at, at 0, and then you ask yourself as you go away from the nucleus, what's the probability of finding an electron, you see that the uh, probability peaks rather quickly close to the nucleus and then it decays rapidly as you go away from the nucleus. Uh, for this 2s orbital here and the, uh, you find that the probability the most probable radius of finding the electron is farther away from the nucleus than it is for the 1s orbital. And just to draw your attention to this color change here so we see that the 1s orbital here is depicted as a blue sphere uh, the reason it's colored blue is because there is a uh, the wave function, the 1s orbital, has a positive amplitude everywhere in space. And so that color is denoted, that positive amplitude is denoted by the blue color. For, um, for this 2s orbital, uh, the wave function goes through one oscillation of both positive and negative amplitude. And so here towards the center of the nucleus, we have a, a wave function with a positive amplitude, and then the amplitude goes to zero, and then there's a negative amplitude uh, portion of the wave function. Now, 
When you're asking yourself what's the probability of finding the electron, you don't actually look at the wave function itself, you look at the wave function squared. So it doesn't matter if the amplitude is positive or negative, all that matters is the magnitude of the square of the wave function. And that essentially is what's depicted here in this curve. So this little um, piece of positive amplitude corresponds to this first peak in this um, radial probability distribution. Uh, the wave function goes through a node, that is it passes from positive amplitude to negative amplitude, and at that node where the amplitude is zero, there's zero probability of finding the electron at that particular radius. But then as you go to larger and larger radii, you find that the function peaks again, so there's a high probability of finding the electron at this distance from the nucleus, and then you see that that um, probability decays rapidly as you go to larger and larger distances. This figure here uh, depicts a 3s atomic orbital, and it goes through two nodes, right? You go from blue to red to blue, that corresponds to positive to negative to positive again amplitude. Uh, when, you, when you take that uh, wave function and you square it to ask yourself, what's the probability of finding the electron at a particular radius? You get a curve that looks like this. It goes through three peaks. And so here is the most probable um, ra uh, radius for finding the electron, and you find that for the 3s atomic orbital, it's even further away from the nucleus than the 2s, which is further away from the nucleus than the 1s most probable radius. And that's going to be true as you go to higher and higher quantum numbers. The, the most probable radii will be further and further away from uh, the nucleus. Uh, the number of nodes that you find in the atomic orbital equals the quantum number, the principal quantum number, minus the angular momentum quantum number, minus 1. So for these s orbitals, L is 0. And so for the 1s orbital, we have 1 minus 0 minus 1. There are 0 radial nodes. For this 2s orbital, the principal quantum number is 2 minus 0 minus 1 gives us 1 radial node. And for the 3s, you'll have 3 minus 0 minus 1. There are two radial nodes in the atomic orbital. So the principal quantum number we associate with both the energy of the electron in an atomic orbital as well as the size or spatial extent of the atomic orbital. Uh, in the next figure, I am um, presenting a little bit more detail about the energy levels for the electron within a hydrogen atom. Uh, and so the, uh, I wanted to draw uh, the following picture here where I'm going to plot the energy uh, as a function of just kind of atomic orbital. And so uh, this line here, this represents the 1s orbital. And then these four lines, these represent the 2s and then the three 2p orbitals, all three of those. And then here we'll have the 3s, then we'll have the 3p uh, orbitals energy, and then you're going to have 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the 5 3d orbitals. And so what I'm trying to indicate here is that the energy of these atomic orbitals in hydrogen only depend upon the principal quantum number, okay? And so when n equals 1, this represents the energy level. When n equals 2, you can be either in a 2s orbital or one of the 3 2p orbitals, but they all have the same energy. We say that these atomic orbitals are degenerate. So these are unique atomic orbitals that have the same energy because they have the same principal quantum number. For the n equals 3, we have a higher degeneracy because there's more orbitals that have the same energy. In total, there are n squared degenerate orbitals. Okay, so you take the principal number and square it, and it tells you how many orbitals have the same energy. So for the for for an n equals one uh, electron, there's only one degenerate orbital. For n equals 2, you square 2, you get a degeneracy of 4. For n equals 3, 
you get a degeneracy of 9. Uh, and so that's how that, that degeneracy formula works. And the word degenerate means uh, equal in energy. Now, when you go to many electron atoms, when you start adding in electrons, interactions between the electrons, they break the spherical symmetry of the hydrogen atom because the electrons are interacting with each other. And that causes the energy to depend on both N and L. And so for a many electron atom, these N equals 2 orbitals are not all equal to one another. The, any, the 2s orbital has a little bit lower energy than the 2p orbitals. Same thing for the 3s and the 3p. Uh, and they're different from the 3d as well. So when you're dealing with many electron atoms, this N squared formula does not apply. This only applies to the hydrogen atom. And the energy diagram looks like this figure that I've drawn over here. Well, in the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the angular momentum quantum number and the magnetic quantum number. Uh, and so this has to do with the quantization of angular momentum. So whenever you have a particle moving around on a sphere, um, making some curved path, uh, the, the, the particle will have what we call an angular momentum. And in quantum mechanics, angular momentum is quantized. And it has to do with the fact that in order for the uh, wave function to be viable for a particle that has motion, uh, say, around a circle or around a sphere, the wave function describing that motion must have a phase match in the sense that when you go completely around the circle, the wave must be in phase with itself, right? So, so this red curve here, this represents some uh, amplitude, some wave function that's oscillating uh, as you go around uh, around in a circle. And if the phase does not match when you go around, say, 2 pi radians, then the wave will destroy itself through destructive interference. This ends up restricting the wavelengths that fit around the, um, this uh, curved domain for, for the uh, electron in an atom, for example. And that's what gives rise to the angular momentum quantum number and also the magnetic uh, quantum number, m sub l. And so that's what these two quantum numbers uh, relate to. They relate to the quantization of angular momentum and the fact that the wave function for the electron must satisfy these geometric phase matching conditions. Uh, it turns out that the, that the angular momentum uh, quantum number l is related to the uh, length of the angular momentum vector, and that in turn determines the shape of the atomic orbital that you're talking about. Uh, that shape can have different orientations in space, and that's what the magnetic quantum number uh, relates to. It relates to the direction in which this angular momentum vector points, uh, and that in turn affects the orientation, the spatial orientation of the atomic orbital. The reason why it's called the magnetic quantum number is because if you put a magnetic field, if you put the hydrogen atom in a magnetic field, it breaks some of the degeneracy. Uh, and so, for example, if I go back to my, my picture here, um, these three uh, 2p orbitals, uh, they all have the same energy. Uh, and if you put the hydrogen atom in a magnetic field, what will happen is, is these energies will split. They will no longer be equal to one another. And so that's why the three value, the, the m sub l value, which, of course, which is what makes these orbitals different from one another. Uh, that's why it's called the magnetic quantum number. The same thing will happen to the three p's as well as the three d's. If you put the hydrogen atom in a magnetic field, it will split these energy levels and break the degeneracy. Um, okay, so next, in the next couple slides, we're going to be talking about the orbital shapes, which are determined by the angular momentum quantum number, and we'll talk about the orientations of the orbitals. So here I'm stating what the shapes are in words and what the orientations are in words and then we're going to look at the pictures on the next uh, slide. So here we're talking about um, different subshells and it turns out that there are um, 2L plus 1 possible orientations 
of the electron's angular momentum. So if you're talking about an s orbital, uh, which has a spherical symmetry, the value of l is 0, and if you plug 0 into this formula here, you get 2 times 0 plus 1. That means there's only one orientation of the electron's angular momentum, and you'll find that there are 0 angular nodes. Uh, for p orbitals, l equals 1. You plug in 1 into this formula, you get 2 times 1 plus 1 gives you 3 possible orientations. Okay? And the number of angular nodes is equal to L. And so there will be one angular node, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Uh, it's that angular node that gives p orbitals their characteristic dumbbell-shaped. Um, and so these three orientations correspond to the three distinct values of m sub L. For d orbitals, you plug in L equals 2, you get five orientations associated with the five possible values of M sub L, and there are two angular nodes, and the orbital ends up looking like about four Easter eggs kind of uh, stacked together in a bundle. Uh, for F orbitals, <coughs> uh, you plug in three, you wind up with seven orientations for the electron's angular momentum, corresponding to the seven different values of M sub L and there end up being three angular nodes in the atomic orbitals profile. And you could keep going with this. You could talk about g orbitals and h orbitals and i-shaped orbitals. Uh, we really only need to think about, well, generally speaking, only the first three. Uh, sometimes we need to think about the f orbitals as well in general chemistry, but not as often as the other three types. So here are some pictures that represent the shape of the orbitals and the orientations in space. So up at the top, uh, s orbitals are spherically symmetric and they have only one spatial orientation. p orbitals, on the other hand, are, are dumbbell shaped and they have three possible orientations. One orientation is along the x-axis, another one along the y-axis, and a third one along the z-axis, and so we'll often call these the px, the py, and the pz atomic orbitals. Uh, for the d orbitals there are five orientations and and for at least four of the pictures you can see why I describe them as Easter eggs because they look a little bit like like eggs here in a bundle and they're they're always shown as either blue or red so they're kind of like painted eggs. In any case there are two angular nodes. Uh, one angular node here for the p orbitals, right? I should say a nodal plane actually. Uh, so along the, for the px orbital, uh, the orbital goes from positive amplitude to negative amplitude, and so there's a nodal plane in between these two lobes. Um, for the pz orbital, the nodal plane is the xy plane, uh, and there's one for the py as well. For these d orbitals, uh, they each have two uh, nodal planes. Uh, for this dxy orbital, there's a nodal plane that is the yz axis, and then there's another one that are the yz plane, and there's another one that is the xz plane, uh, which you can see there. Um, for the dx, it's just it's just like the picture is turned in a different way, and so you have a different pair of um, of nodal planes. Uh, the same thing for these other two um, atomic orbitals as well. For the dz squared, it's a little bit trickier to see where the um, to see where the nodal planes are, they're actually nodal cones. So for example, here you have, let's call this uh, positive amplitude here in this sort of donut shape, and then we'll say negative amplitude here in the uh, top and bottom lobes. Uh, there's a nodal cone, cone that um, encapsulates this negative lobe, and there's a second nodal cone that encapsulates that. So if you can imagine a cone that points upward like this and surrounds this uh, negative lobe and there's one that points downward uh, that encapsulates this negative uh, lobe. Um, and so those are the two nodes for the dz squared orbital. Here I just went ahead and since I called these uh, Easter eggs I just went ahead and called these jelly beans. Um, anyway you'll find that there are uh, three nodal planes in each of these pictures that you can that you can find and they're oriented in different ways with respect to x, y, and z. So the three pz orbitals are distinguished by their three values of m sub l, the five 
Uh, d orbitals are distinguished by their five values of m sub l, and there are seven values of m sub l for f orbitals, corresponding to different orientations of the atomic orbital. We really need to know the s and the p ones quite well. We need to be familiar with the d orbitals, and we don't really need to know too much about the f orbitals in general chemistry. Uh, so if you focus your attention on these, uh, these orbitals up at the top, uh, you'll do just fine. Uh, next, we're going to talk about electron spin, which really comes into play when you have more than one electron in your system. So what is electron spin? Well, basically, it turns out that electrons have uh, an intrinsic magnetic moment, which means that they act like a little magnetic, uh, a, little, a little bar magnet. So they have a north pole and a south pole to them. And it's just a property of the electrons, much like the electron charge or the electron mass electrons have a magnetic moment. And we call this um, property, this magnetic moment, we call it electron spin. And the reason we call it spin is because it's known from classical physics, if you take a charged particle that moves around uh, in a circle, it creates a magnetic field, much like a magnet does. And so the, the idea here is that the electron has some intrinsic um, motion to it, that, uh, that creates this, uh, this uh, magnetic moment. Uh, and so we call it, the, we, you know, the, the cute idea is that the electron is spinning. However, electrons, as far as I know, they have no uh, size to talk about. And so I don't think that the electron is pictured as literally spinning. It's just analogous to a spinning charge. In any case, the magnetic moment, the spin of an electron is, is a property of the electron, and it turns out that that spin is quantized. And you can think of it as a, as a vector that points either up or down with respect to some applied magnetic field. And so we call one orientation of the electron spin, spin up, and we call the other one spin down. And so there are two possible uh, values for m sub s for an electron plus one-half and minus one-half. So we have, um, we have the four quantum numbers, n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. There's another principle in quantum mechanics, which you can effectively think is one of the postulates of quantum mechanics, uh, that states, in essence, or at least for atoms, it states that no two electrons in the same atom can have the same set of quantum numbers. So I'm going to distinguish between two types of orbitals. One I'm going to call a spin orbital that is described by n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. A spin orbital is a wave function for a single electron, and that electron can be either up or down. So m sub s can be either plus one half or minus one half. Um, I'm going to call a spatial orbital uh, it, it's, it's the same thing as a spin orbital, but we don't think about the spin when we're talking about the spatial orbital. Uh, we'll think about the three principal quantum numbers that we've looked at just now, and so really the pictures that I've shown you are spatial orbitals. Uh, and a spatial orbital can represent up to two electrons, an electron pair. Uh, one must be spin up and the other must be spin down. The reason we say that is because no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. So you need four quantum numbers to describe a single electron. You need three quantum numbers to describe an electron pair where one electron is spin up and the other one is spin down. So we'll use the idea here that each spatial orbital, each viable combination of n, l, and m sub l can represent two electrons of opposite spin. Okay, And this table here it essentially counts up the number of electrons that you can put in a given type of um, uh, a given type of atomic orbital. So for an s orbital with l equals zero, there is only one type of orbital, right? Uh, there's only one value of m sub l that's possible for l equals zero, and that one orbital can hold up to two electrons: one spin up and the other spin down. For a p-type orbital, l equals 1, and there are um, three orientations of that angular momentum. There are three values of m sub l, right? Minus 1, 0, and plus 1. So there's three 
spatial orbitals for a p subshell. Each of these can hold two electrons, so a maximum number of six electrons can fit inside a p-type subshell. For uh, a d-type orbital, there are five orientations of the electron's angular momentum, five values of m sub l, times two gives you a total of ten electrons that can fill a d subshell. For an f subshell, there are seven uh, unique orbitals that make up the f subshell, and you can hold a total of 14, uh, 14 electrons in an f shell. Here's the general results, you know, so for a given, for an arbitrary value of L, there are two L plus one orbitals. Uh, you double that, and that's the maximum number of electrons uh, that that particular subshell can hold. Well, in this figure, we are going to be uh, counting, counting uh, electrons and things like that. And so uh, here we're being asked to calculate the maximum number of electrons that can occupy a shell, not a subshell, but a shell with a n equals 2. Okay, So for an n equals 2 shell, there is the 2s atomic orbital. There are the three 2ps. Uh, and that's, that's it. So we have one atomic orbital, and then there's three 2p's. Each of these atomic orbitals can hold up to two electrons. Okay? So you could put two electrons in there, you could put two in there, two in there, and two in there. So you get a total of six, seven, eight. So for an n equals two shell, there's a maximum number of eight electrons that can, be, uh, that can fill the n equals two shell. For n equals 5, you can have a 5s orbital. You could have the 5ps. There's three of them. There's the 5ds. I'm going to put, go ahead and put the, the, uh, the, the, the 5fs down here. And then you're going to have um, a set of g orbitals as well. I believe there's going to be nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So there's also the five, the five g's. Um, each of these little lines here, each of these unique orbitals, can hold up to two electrons. And it's a little bit easier to use the general formula that. For, uh, the, for a given value of the principal quantum number, there are n squared orbitals. And so if you count up the lines, there should be uh, 25 orbitals. Each can hold two electrons, so you should be able to have 50 electrons. You should be able to put 50 electrons in all of these atomic orbitals. Uh, for the next case here, we have, um, well, I I've essentially already done it. If you have uh, a principal quantum number of n, there are n squared orbitals, and then you can put two electrons per orbital, so there will be two n squared, two n squared electrons. So that's the answer for part C. Uh, part C of part A, I should say. Uh, in the follow-up part, part B, uh, here we're doing the problem backwards. We're supposing that we have 32 electrons, and they want to know what is the principal quantum number. We set that equal to 2n squared, and then solve for n. So you're going to get 16 equals n squared, and then you'll find that n equals 4. Okay, So this is the n equals 4 shell that we're talking about in this part B. Uh, here we have a, uh, this is kind of a fun exercise, we're being asked to fill in a table, and so this helps us understand our, our quantum numbers and how they affect the number of um, uh, available orbitals to us for filling with electrons. So here we have, um, I'll just write, I'll just fill out the table like this, orbital, we have principal quantum number, angular momentum, uh, the m sub l degeneracy, that is how many values of n sub l are there, and then the number of radial, radial nodes, which is equal to n minus l minus 1. 
Okay, so that'll be the table that we're filling out. Uh, for a 4f orbital, n equals 4. For, um, uh, for an f orbital, we're going to have n equal, uh, we'll have l equals, uh, let's see, it would be 3. Uh, for the degeneracy, it's 2 times l plus 1. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. So we're, we'll have 3 times 2 6. It's going to be 7 degenerate orbitals. And then the number of radial nodes uh, for a 4f orbital is going to be 4 minus 3 minus 1. So we're going to wind up with 0, 0 radial nodes in that case. For uh, an orbital that has a principal quantum number of 4 and a angular momentum quantum number of 1, this would be a 4p orbital. And the number of degenerate um, number of degenerate orbitals would be two uh, uh, degenerate m sub l values would be two times l, so two plus one gives us three, three equivalent four p orbitals. Number of radial radial nodes four minus one minus one, so we're going to have two radial nodes in that case. For the principal quantum number of seven and a degeneracy value of three. Again, that's going to correspond to a p-type orbital, so l will be equal to 1, and so we would call this a 7p orbital. How many radial nodes would we have? We'd have 7 minus 1 minus 1. There would be 5 radial nodes in that, um, for that particular orbital. In the last case, we have a 5d orbital. Okay, so the principal quantum number is 5. The angular momentum quantum number is 2. 2 times 2 plus 1 gives us 5. Uh, uh, values of m sub l that are possible, and then for the number of radial nodes, it'll be 5 minus 2 minus 1, so it's going to be uh, 5 minus 3 will give us 2 radial nodes for that orbital. So I think I'm going to stop this video here, and we'll start with the electron configurations uh, in the next one.